Hi everyone, this is the second Liberty Works vodcast. Today I have Stephen Cable, senior writer at Liberty Works, and we're going to discuss some of the issues of the week. Uh, Stephen, welcome again to the Liberty Works podcast. Um, how you been? Thanks, Justin. Great to be here, man. Fantastic. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty busy week. It it certainly has been. Certainly has been. So. First of all, I'm going to explain the Band-Aid on my head. Um, uh, I've had an encounter with a wall. Um, the, um, I was on my way to a um, important meeting that I that it was had to, and I'd given myself plenty of time to get there. And as I was walking out the door, I was adjusting my tie, looking at my reflection in a glass door, and not looking where I was going. And went smack into the side of the wall and split open my head um, and blood went everywhere. It was crazy. Um, and I, I have a theory that the wall decided to um, bash the fash and and that um, <laughs> and that um, yeah, it's um, that we now need to regulate walls everywhere. The government needs to require all walls have padding and warning signs and <laughs> so that that's that's my explanation that um about that so but in the serious news there's been a few big yeah. issues uh Stephen. there's um uh there's the big one um i don't know if you remember liberty works uh nicola wright on our team wrote a story a year ago about um about the guys who did the false beheading outside of the Bendigo Council. Do you remember that that story? Uh, Blair Cotterill and the... Uh... Uh, no, that one was before my time. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a big... Uh, big. St it was sort of a big story at the time. It was about the same time when 18C, 18C was a really big issue. And Liberty Works issued the warning saying, hey, it's not just 18C. There's this state-based legislation especially in Victoria, that's a concern. And the court case finally came out for these guys who did a fault, uh, fake beheading. Um, and and they got a criminal conviction and a $2,000 fine. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so um, so yeah, everyone should be able to see, um, see that. So basically, Blair Cotterill, um, he's the chairman or leader of whatever of the... Um, um, Australian Patriots Front um, got got a criminal conviction and a two thousand dollar fine. So, uh, Stephen, what do you do? You think that there should be laws against people doing fake beheadings out the front of councils? Uh, I read about this one today, and uh, apparently in the Victorian law, you you don't even have to have somebody make a complaint uh, if you when something like this happens. Yes. Um, and that's pretty amazing, actually. It basically just gives the government carte blanche. If they don't like it, they can just sort of do something. Uh, uh, I don't think you should be... It, basically, it's a freedom of speech in a way. Um, and again, it, it comes back... To me, it comes back down to the, the whole issue of what's behind the locked door. If you constantly stop people from raising issues... Uh, from doing a, saying whatever they want to say, people are going to start wondering, well, what are you trying to cover up? But if you let people talk, explain their situation, and then you can engage them. And if they're wrong, prove them wrong in a discussion. Um, there's been some people who've done so many different types of protests in the Western world, uh, Australia as well, uh, that have been far worse than uh, that, I would think. And, and again, you're just bringing more attention to the situation. If you really didn't like it, uh, the best thing, I would never have heard of them if they hadn't put them on trial. I would never have heard of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and just to go back a bit, um, I didn't mention that the original thing they were protesting about was um, the uh, the proposal to build a um, to build a mosque in Bendigo. I actually have no idea if that went went mm. ahead or whatever happened with that. I suspect it did, but I, I to be honest, I I don't know. And there's been a related story. Um, mm. I believe it's the same guys, or at least the same group. And they've gone. Um, oops, sorry, wrong, wrong screen. 
Um, and did you hear about the um, about the far right guys who um, who um, bro uh, broke into the Yarrow Council meeting, interrupted the Yarrow Council meeting? Did you hear about that one? I I briefly saw the the news flash up there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and you see, to me. Um, this is a very distinct issue. One was a protest that wasn't affecting anyone, and and the other th the other mm. is disrupting a de democratically elected council. Now the fact they're all um, commo, commo greens <laughs> on that council and want to ban <laughs> Australia Day doesn't come into it. You know, like uh, even even um, even communists have the right to um, right to assemble. And to me, that's where it crossed the line. And of course, the the left do this kind of thing all the time. You know, you can't have a lecture, you know, yes. with someone like Charles Murray or somebody like that without without um without the um uh you know left going in. And the police really do nothing. But of course, in this case, because it's the far right, people are having a massive freak out about it. But I, I just want to make it absolutely clear for on my point of view. I think what these guys did was completely unacceptable, and whatever relevant criminal charges um, apply, they they should be um, they they should be on the receiving end of that. As should people who who go and um, interrupt university lectures and these sorts of things as well. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, what's yeah. your thought on that? Uh, I would like to see. I would like to see that universally. I'd love to see what you're saying there universally applied, that if you're a lefty outfit disrupting a meeting you don't like, uh, it's equally applied to you as somebody on the other side yeah. uh, disrupting what? a council meeting. Um, it, it's it, It's got to be even-handed. And uh, like you say, if they've been elected, yes, they're insane, uh, as it were, but, you know, they're having a, a sort of, um, you know, a legally convened council meeting and they're deliberating – the way to win that is to uh, get elected and start standing up uh, in the council for the things you believe in rather than letting these other people get into council all the time. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, yeah, and equally so. I mean, it just seems constantly for the last 15, 20 years, um, you know, you can go and interrupt an AGM meeting or, you know, of a major bank or a mining company or um, or a university lecture or all that kind of thing, um, and really just um, um, tread on other people's right to assemble, other people's right to free speech, and it seems these people get away mm. with it. You know, some of those people are in Parliament mm. now for the Greens. You know, who made a career out of doing that kind of thing, and it's just unacceptable. Yeah, um, and. Um, and you know, there's not. Much... Yeah, well, th this is this is the way the media. This is the way the media swing that. If you're on the left and you interrupt a meeting, it's because you're passionate about your beliefs. If you're on the right and you interrupt a meeting, it's because you're a lawless, outright rat bag. Yeah, you see the difference in the headline there. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely, and um, and you know, the hypocrisy is um is breathtaking, but I I just think it's important we put mm. it out there that. That you know, even though I'm guessing neither you or I support changing Australia Day, and we don't, we don't like the kind of ridiculous grandstanding um, of the Yarra City Council. They should focus on pe picking up people's bins and you know improving local facilities, not this nonsense. Um, uh, oh, but, absolutely. Yeah, but um, it's completely not okay to break up their meeting. Um, so. Mm -hmm. In other, in another story um, that's come up, um, this the power issue is just not going away at all. Like the um, uh, we've we've now seen. Um, I don't know if you've been following it with AGL that their Liddell coal power plant is set to shut down by mm. 20, um, 2022. and AGL has also yes. said it's getting out of coal by twenty fifty, I believe, which is pretty much meaningless that's that's a really long long way away and there's now become a tussle between yep. the australian government Mal malcolm turnbull as prime minister 
uh, and AGL that he had a meeting with them to try to keep this Liddell coal power plant station going. And and uh, they've yep. said they've said no. They had the meeting, and then uh, within you know minutes, I believe, or you know a few hours, they came out and said no, nope, still shutting it down. And now where there's even talk of nationalising this power plant. So, you know, what what do you think? What do you think about this whole saga? Like, where do we go from here? How do we secure our energy future? Yeah, I've been sort of looking at this uh, story in quite a lot of uh, detail, actually. It's on the front page of The Australian. It's in the main page of The Enquirer uh, today as well. Um, it's, it's big news. Uh, it's, it's the centre of the economy is energy. And um, mm. uh, you know, this isn't going away soon. It is a complete mess caused by governments. It's a completely unnecessary mess. Um, and AGL... Uh, as you quite rightly pointed out, and as uh, Matt Canavan pointed out, are uh, just completely hypocrites in this. Uh, 90% of the power that they supply comes from fossil fuels uh, right now. Uh, the idea that you could go to completely emissions-free, which isn't true anyway, but the, the idea that you could go to emissions-free by 2050 is, is a complete nonsense. They make an absolute mozza out of the higher-priced energy. The more the energy costs us, the more profit they make. Uh, so they're in it for the money. And um, it also was revealed in the paper today that, or uh, the other day, that um, one of the main people that's behind the media campaign they're running today, you know, at the moment, you know, that guy that's walking in front of the windmill saying we're getting out of coal because yeah. it's the right thing to do. Well, the, the one of the people that's running that campaign for them is um, an ex get up activist. No, you don't say. You do, I did. I did hear that. I no, hear I. That. Yeah. Yeah. So I, they they've done their march for the institutions. Now they're doing their march for the corporations, and it's it's all done in such a way as to make you think. Oh, look, everyone's just moving in this direction, and uh, oh, even these big name corporations are on board. They they're not. Uh, you know, as in you know, for the reasons they're saying, it's because people within those organisations are pushing the message. Yeah, yeah. There's also the issue of sovereign risk. I, the, it, even da David Linehelm came out and basically said, you know, the government might have to build a coal power plant, you know, like pay someone or underwrite it. And, and to get David Linehelm, Senator David Linehelm with the Liberal Democrats to some, say something like that is quite astounding. But the situation we're in right now is the sovereign risk for any private investor to invest in any um, baseload power capacity is so huge that you wouldn't do it unless you got some, mm. you know, uh, government contract that said that if the next government, the next Labor government or the next uh, wet liberal government that comes in decides, oh, we're getting out of coal, that you'll still make all your money. And uh, and so mm. it's an interesting thing that the sovereign risk, once um, you know, once sovereign risk reaches a certain level, and I think you saw the same thing with the MBN, you know, that once Telstra was privatised, but they kept wanting to run Telstra as a as a public utility, they weren't really willing to let it run as a as a, a private company. They still were, you know, the ACCC and all of these, I think it had its own om ombudsman actually, but, um, you know, they still wanted to treat it like a government-owned utility. Um, basically, you had a situation where Telstra wasn't going to upgrade their network to fibre because they knew if they did, the state would just come in and regulate it and force it to force them to give access to that network to all their competitors in an uneconomical way. That's my that's my personal theory on it. And I, I it's now the same situations happen with base load power that no one's really game to do anything around base load power because if they do, they worry that um, they'll be shut down or that the government will continue to flood the market with renewable energy yet regulate them in a way that they have to still provide provide the baseload power that makes that renewable viable um so 
yeah, it's um, th this whole sovereign risk issue is a massive issue, and once government, I think what it shows is once government gets involved, it's very hard to get government out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in um, in Finkel's report, uh, he's uh, it reads a bit like um, you know, some sort of um, status diktat where. Uh, they're sort of trying to order companies to uh, do this, that, and the other, and, and keep their uh, coal-fired power stations open, uh, even though they're loss-making, because mm. um, people are buying or being forced to buy all their high-powered power from uh, renewable or unreliable sources, is what I would call them. But you're right about the sovereign risk, and uh, yeah, who would invest money uh, in a situation where you know any future government to just come along and completely wreck it, um, and the as you quite rightly observed, as David Lionhelm said, um, the best option is going to be for a government to underwrite it. I don't think they should build it, but they should certainly give guarantees to allow a private company to do it mm. and give that regulatory certainty. And uh, and if that's not going to work, then build it yourself. Uh, as you say, the last thing we would like as libertarians is to see the government expanding more in that area, but you may have no choice to yes. fix this problem. If AGL and others are, own these power plants, are going to insist on closing them. Um, you either do that or, or you use executive power to step in and, and take control of it, which is, again, is it just another form of government interference? Yes. Um, the best way uh, is just don't interfere in the first place and just let everyone compete for them on price and service. Yes. I, I think this is becoming a bigger and bigger thing. And um, as we're getting more of these corporate lefties, um, they're getting very good. I think they're getting very, very good at playing the game of, of, um, of wrecking the market and then saying, oh, look, the market failed. <laughs> the market didn't fail. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, the government interfered in the market, causing a government failure. Mm. That's so the market couldn't function. And... Um, Mm. And but they call that they use that term market failure um, very loosely. So an example of that would be the former senator Larissa Waters was a um, uh, environmental lawyer prior to being in the Greens. So which basically meant she was always in. Yeah, the that's Greens. a surprise. Yeah, yeah, and um, <laughs> and and so effectively, you know, um, the IPA's done a lot on lawfare. So if they use government power and government regulation and to just absolutely r um, run any kind of ac r private property right people have to do the things that they should be able to do under the law. Um, and then they just really up and up and up and up mm. that, that sovereign risk um, that it, uh, it now becomes unviable. And then they can go, oh, Look at that. Yeah, and um, Adani's the perfect example. Yeah, no bank's going to touch Adani. Like, are you, are you, if it weren't for these tactics, are you telling me that a bank wouldn't invest in a coal mine? <laughs> you know, that's... Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. Or not invest, but right. you, you know what I mean. Um, you know, provide banking, um, provide loans to a, um, to a coal mine. It's It's... Um, and it's a it's a challenging issue. So I think when you've got conservative governments in, one thing they need to do is um, remove these uh, these tactics from from the lefties by uh, making sure that absolutely the, that is a very big issue. Mm, uh, making sure that the if, if they can't the, win, they can't win through. Yep, sorry, go on. There you go. No, go on, Stephen, sorry. So if, if this is a very good this is a very good point you bring up, mm. and this is a classic tactic from them all over the world. If they can't win through the ballot box, they'll try and win in the courts. Yeah. And uh, you know, they're, they're not happy with the democratic will. They're only happy with their will. And you're quite right. If this, we had a market where everybody was competing on price and service, um, Coal-fired power would be all the rage and banks wouldn't be able to invest in it fast enough because it's a sure winner. Uh, you'd find the same with nuclear energy as well. Mm. I think France gets like 70, 75% of its power from nuclear energy. It works great. 
and we should have a world leading nuclear energy here uh, uh, industry here in Australia, and people would be investing in it. But like you say, because these people have these avenues that they can use to trip it up and destroy it, uh, they'll just say, well, we'll just go and invest somewhere else. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's right. And um, I think whatever process, you know, obviously you need, um, you know, proper environmental protections in place, but it should be a case that you apply for it, you do all the things that you're asked to do. They, you know, the relevant government department approves it and you know perhaps there's some capacity there for someone to challenge that in the courts but once that challenge is being done like mm. you know then then it's green light you're going ahead but that's not what happens in the real world so on a last note um you wanted no, to talk about that. oh you wanted to talk about um civil society and and the um you know, uh, and the role that can play. So, so would you like to talk a bit about about civil society? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because government's involved in so much of our lives and in so many areas, and there's a department for this, a department for that, a department of the other. Um, people seem to think, and would have the idea, quite rightly, if that's all you'd ever seen, that the government is the solution to everything, and governments attract people into them generally that like using government to fix everything can do everything. Uh, so you have this sort of cyclical problem that uh, people get led to believe that government's meant to be doing this and fixing that and fixing the other, and then it attracts people into it that have this messianic view of life that they're destined to use the government to fix every problem. Um, and yet it, it's, it's a view that like there's nothing else out there that operates within society to fix problems and to help people other than the government. It's a very like one-dimensional view of life. Uh, there's only one solution. And yet, throughout the history of our civilization, there's been so many charitable organizations uh, that are just out there, ready and willing to help. There's like this, there's always people out there for whatever reason, religious reasons, just compassion reasons, start charities, they want to help people, They're, you know, their whole life revolves around wanting to help and serve other people. And if you were to give assistance to them, if the government wanted to do anything, you would get uh, twice the result for half the money. You know, if, can you imagine like if you let the Salvation Army or the Swiss Smith family uh, and you gave them funding rather than setting up a whole heap of uh, additional uh, government work and, and government housing and um, you know government emergency accommodation and all that sort of thing and let those – uh, people fulfill their natural role within society. They would do so much of a better job. I know the Salvation Army is one of the first groups in uh, the UK uh, many years ago that started helping unemployed men find work. Yes. Uh, and it was natural for them. They just wanted to help people. They just loved people. They wanted to help them. Um, why would you need a government agency to do that when there's already people in society that are doing it? Absolutely. So it's it's a big part of it's a big part of civilization that's is being missed out, mm. and I know that they continue to operate, but it's a really good argument for why the government should get out a lot of those things, and if you're going to do anything, well, give it to the people that are born to do it. Well, I, I'll, um, that's a perfect example of what, um, because I used to work in, um, in the Job Services Australia system as an employment consultant, and, um, and that is basically an extension of the Department of Employment Workplace Relations now, and um, and even though it, you, it's done by charities, it's all under the regulations of the government and and so on. And there's absolutely no um, place now for the kind of um, uh, organisation you would talk, you're talking about because people are already required to go to the government um, supported program. Mm. So and to be honest, they don't do a very good job. They um, they're they're not they're not very effective at all because and they spend most of their energy on the people who don't want help, you know the very um the very mm. difficult cases because that's where the funding is. You don't you don't get any help. You don't get any, much funding at all if you help someone who's you know just lost their job and needs to help finding some something else. So um it's not a very good system mm. and i have a feeling that people who are just doing it as a charitable thing um 
would do a much better job. Um, and on there is a book that yeah. was given to people who attended the Friedman um, conference that um, talks about the issue you're talking about. So I'll hold it up to the camera. Um, after the Welfare State, it's uh, it's by the Atlas Network, um, and it's edited by Tom G. Palmer. Mm. You would have received that one. Um, did you... Oh, no, you didn't go, did you, to Friedman? No, I wasn't at the Friedman Conference, but that issue is covered quite extensively in a book called The Welfare State We're In. Ah, right, yes. Where the history of charitable work in the UK... Yeah, the history of charitable work in the UK was covered quite extensively in there. And one of the keys to success uh, in this issue is the personal relationship that develops. Uh, it's, it's done by people in the community who are close to the people that are being helped, and they inquire very carefully uh, and compassionately about what they're circumstances are to avoid people that are just gaming the system but making sure those that really need it do get the help they need but not just dishing out cash uh it's also giving them advice and help and how to get themselves on their feet and get that self-respect yes. uh, that they need so you you get that personal touch and interaction it's not just a money transfer from the federal bank account into some bloke no one has ever met nobody knows and all they do is fill out a form every now and again it had that personal element to it so you know the guy that lives down the road or you know people that know him and, and then you find out well yeah okay he never seems to be able to get a job you know there's something going on here let's have a closer look yes. and it's that personal interaction that makes it so much more effective when it's on the ground yeah absolutely you know a really big thing in our society now that people have is that they they think they have the right not to be judged you know, they get really, you know, and that's why people mm. like the state welfare because you're dealing with a bureaucrat. The fact you're spending all of the money you're giving on alcohol and drugs and and um, you, you're supposedly um, poor, but you've got a big curve, you know, Samsung curved TV in your living room and all of that kind of thing. They don't... <laughs> Um, you yeah. know, people have this real attitude, oh, you know, how dare you judge me? And even in that, the, um, the film and book, Angela's Ashes, you know, you see them all lining up to get the charity from the church and how bad it was being judged. And, um, that's a big thing. But when we got, a, got rid of that, uh, civil society aspect where, yes, if you're receiving help from someone else, you, you're... They're judging you for it, and they're holding your account, and that's yes. not a nice feeling, and it's embarrassing. When we lost that, we lost a lot, of, you know, we lost a lot else. We lost, um, and now people just think it's entitlement, that, that they're entitled to other people's mm. other people's money. And, um, and, unfortunately, Absolutely. and unfortunately, that attitude is spread from the... It's spread from sort of the lower classes to the working class, and now it's spreading into the middle class. And now you've got people who are mortgage-dressed who who now think they're entitled mm. to um, gov state state assistance, um, which is quite mm. astounding, mm. astounding, you know. Um, and in the end, it's all just your own money anyway that the government takes from you and... <laughs> and gives a half, especially once you become once you're middle class they're just giving you the money they took from you in the first place back you know on your child care subsidies and things so if they just didn't take it from you in the first place you'd be fine oh yeah absolutely look this um uh no one is has a right to somebody else's property no uh, uh, as a fundamental bottom line, nobody has a right to anything that's mine, but as a compassionate civil human being, I'm, all, all, I'm willing to help. Mm. And as a society, we, we are willing to help. It's, it's the history of our society. We are willing to help, but it's, as I think it was famously John Howard that famously said, it's a hand up. Um, you know, it's a hand up. It's, it's, it's not like a lifestyle. It's a safety net. It's, it's not meant to be a permanent situation. No. And, uh, yeah, we, we are. We, human beings are very compassionate. In just about every civilization, you'll see this. Um, 
doesn't it doesn't it doesn't matter what the religious or cultural foundation of the site is. There's always people there that are willing to help. Okay, yeah, well, um, you're in hard times. Let's help you out. But it's not a lifestyle. No. And no. I come from I come from an area um, in the Northern Territory where um, there is just entire communities, Aboriginal communities, that are completely reliant on welfare. There, there's no reason for the community to be there other than their cultural attachment to the land. But it's being completely supported basically on welfare payments. Uh, and uh, many years ago, the charitable organisations in Australia, particularly the Catholic and the Anglican ca charities, uh, established industries in those areas and had work programs and actually had productive fishing operations and other things like that going on. You know, it was, it was underway. And then the government said, oh, let me help. And, and you know what that means when the government says, let me help. It basically just completely destroyed it. Um, basically with the advent of the Whitlam government. Uh, yes. it, it, you know, there was lots of Aboriginal people involved in the pastoral industries up there throughout the Northern Territory. Mm. And then, um, you know, someone with a, a big idea and lots of other people's money destroyed it. Mm, mm, mm. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, the, and I, you know, the, the problem with all these programs is you end up paying for them, but... For me, um, and for I'd imagine for you as well, that if you were to lose your employment or something like that, um, you would. It's it's not an inappropriate program. I mean, um, you know, the uh, the unemployment benefit wouldn't stop the bank foreclosing on my home loan and all that kind of thing. Um, so it's not a no. all of these programs and the fact that it takes your income. Yeah income away from you disincentivizes you to do things privately to um to protect you know take out private private insurance you know uh, private unemployment insurance for mm, exactly and so on um now on a slightly related note um uh, one nation um has been making a lot of noise around the family family courts about reforming the family courts and um uh and so I've found that a fairly interesting and contentious issue. It just seems like one of those issues that the big parties don't want to touch, yet every man and woman on the street knows that the, the system's broken. Mm. Um, yeah, so... Uh, go on, yeah, sorry. No, you're right. Um, I was just... I haven't been reading a lot about that lately. I have in the past. I know that when uh, Pauline Hanson was first elected to the Senate this uh, in the last year, um, they said that reform of the family law court was going to be a big priority, um, mainly focusing on the fact that men often get uh, the raw end of the deal. Mm. Uh, I hadn't heard any recent details like you have, but um, you do hear a lot of cases where it gets very skewed again in the outcome against the men. Yes. And, um, mm. and there needs to be a balance there. I, I know some guys that have been really, really badly uh, shafted and, uh, and 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 the system's balanced the, is tilted against them, and I think they just want to make sure that fairness is there. Mm. Uh, any family breakdown is always difficult to deal with, and a judge, some judges must pull their hair out trying to find some way through it. Oh, uh, but it's got to be fair. And uh, there's a lot of abuse of um, AVOs. Um, there's also um, uh, there's also I think there's an issue with legal aid that often often. Um, you know, the um, one side gets access to legal aid and the other side mm. doesn't, and yet the other side's certainly not in a position to be paying legal fees. Um, mm. And and the whole, the whole idea of the family court was to, to make these things simpler. Um, and, um, and then, of course, you factor in um, uh, the factor that, um, that, you know, a lot of... Um, most divorces are initiated by by the woman, <laughs> and that that's not that's not um, something that's that's uh, factored into it at all. That someone you know whoever there's no um, measure of fault in the in the system at all. Um, it, it the whole thing mm. just seems mm. really messed up. And then you've also got the same um, situation of um, deadbeat dads too. So it doesn't work for mothers as well. You know the single mothers who um who have um you know who have the guy who their ex-husband is getting paid in cash and 
and so the whole system just seems from all kinds of angles seems completely completely broken and um uh, and um so i i think this is one to watch um you know whether or not it's a libertarian issue i'm not sure but um but i i think in a way it is because it's a state really sticking its nose into the business of the family yeah it, it's it family breakdown is never easy it, it's uh, i come from a divorced family um my mum uh, and dad divorced when i was five um and yeah, it's always it's always messy. I, I I haven't heard of many amicable, easy separations. You know where everything's just perfect and everyone turns out all right. No. Uh, no. And again, you're you're using that, you're, you're using the broad power of the state, uh, which is is really there for like really serious issues like uh, property crime and personal crime and assaults. You know that's what the law is really for. Uh, and then it has to delve into the area of the family, like you're talking about, and you know, to know all the personalities involved and to know all the background and stuff. Um, many years ago, that's the sort of thing your mum and dad and your uncles and your grandparents could have really helped out with, and you'd give you advice, and they'd say, "Well, you're probably taking it a bit too far. Mm. It's not as bad as you're saying," or help you out with some good advice. And now you've got a judge and lawyers trying to fill that role in society that used to be provided by extended family, and it's never going to be easy. It's well, never going to be easy. And uh, the best way to fix it is to help people keep their marriages together. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm with you there. I'm, and the good news is, though, um, the the divorce rate is dropping. So that's that's um, that's good news. That is good news. Um, mm. uh, what you're saying about sort of the system pushing you into that direction, it's, it's interesting. With my little injury there, um, because it happened on my way out of work, the the doctor's surgery was oh no that's not Medicare that's work cover, and so and so it's, <laughs> in, it's interesting the way legislation funnels you know in a private capacity I would never think me walking into a wall has anything to do with my employer, um and mm. and so um I know I'm drawing a long bow here but um but you can see that someone who starts out you know, wanting to do the right thing, the moment the lawyers get involved mm. and and family re, Australia and all that kind of thing and telling them their rights, um, they um, mm -hmm. you I could see how you very easily will find your way into a very legalistic, nasty court battle because you kind of get funneled into Oh, absolutely. It. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so it's... And your, your issue there where you, you, the guy said, oh, that's work cover, that very reason, that, that very issue is the reason why so many workplaces have these idiotic, nonsensical work health and safety things where they sit you down in a room and tell you where to put a hot cup of coffee. Yeah. Because someone somewhere has been sued by their employee because they hurt themselves at work because they spilled a cup of coffee or they tripped over something. And so they're just so risk averse, they have to take every step to do everything to show that they've made sure you're aware that you don't pour hot coffee over yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um it's it's a nut system, you know, like um yeah, so I really wasn't given any choice in it at all. So I had to pay in full $220 to get a few stitches. Um to um mm. and then have to claim it back through work cover work cover so and we'll see how that goes but instead of it being a private matter it's now something that it, my employer has to get dragged into so that's um it, i i just found that that's sort of an anecdotal example of um of how rules and regulations ends up changing your behavior because as a private person i would never it would never occur to me that that had anything to do with my employer so, yes. so you, know, right. you hear these you hear these situations of where you know in a breakup a woman a woman um, puts out an AVO or so on. Like, where are they getting these ideas? I don't think there's that many nasty women in the world, you know. So obviously, someone in the system, whether it's the lawyers or the relationships with Australia person, there's something in the system that's um, 
that's nudging them towards towards doing these kinds of things. Um, yeah, well, if you're someone who's in that, if you're someone who's in that system, the last thing you're going to do if someone comes to you and, and there's work in it for you is say, nah, nothing to do here. Maybe <laughs> like the newspaper saying, no news today. You know, they're going they're going to print something. You know, they, they have to put something in there, whether they make it up, twist it. Or even get it right, you know. They've got to put something in there, and it's the same with uh, someone at Family Australia or wherever those organisations are. Someone comes to them. We need to do something. It's my job to make something happen, you know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, um, I think that's uh, we've been going now for forty-seven minutes, so um, or it's, um, for about forty minutes. So um, we might wrap up here. I'll just remind people to go and get their tickets to. Um, to the uh, Liberty Fest in in Brisbane, um, I was working with uh, Andrew Cooper, president of uh, Liberty Works, the other day, coming up with an agenda, and we've got some really um, just in draft stages, so I can't really um, uh, come out with it. But we've got some really um, exciting exciting things on the agenda, some real um, uh, interesting debates that we'll have. So people might get a bit hot under the cover. Uh, under the collar and some of those ones. Uh, in um, Sydney, we've got um, an event. If you go to our events page with um, uh, Ian Plymer um, about climate change, uh, which would be a really good one if you happen to be in Sydney um, at that time. And finally, um, a really popular one, uh, Joe, Joe Nova in Perth. So we've got, we've got lots of events happening at the moment. So... Uh, go to our events page, um, uh, come along, they're fantastic events. And, and thank you for your time. Catch you later. Bye.